Morning, everybody. Uh, Happy New Year um, to most of you I haven't spoken to. Um, we're still getting some people that are coming in here at the tail end. And so as they enter the room, I've got to mute them and admit them at the same time. So if you see me a little distracted for a few minutes, that's because everyone is there's still people coming in. So I can see a few of your faces, like Gloria Osteen. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Can you hear me? Good. All right. Well, uh, again, Happy New Year. Um, I wanted to take the time to give you an update on the letter agreements that the Treasury issued on January 14th, last Thursday. Now that we've had a little bit of time to dissect them. They're very complicated um, agreements, and yet at the same time, they're very simple. Um, and we're going to you know, try and break them down and give you some perspective on what they mean at this point and how it's going to affect both the timeline of Fannie and Freddie recapitalization and release. And at the same time, um, what it will do, um, you know, to, to the share price action, which is, you know, what we're most important, what, what is most important to all of us. So let me start out by talking about the litigation. I'm going to go through the litigation. I'm going to go through the capital requirements. I'm going to go through the retention, and I'm going to go through the government's interest in Fannie and Freddie following this letter agreement. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is litigation. On December 9th, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in the Collins case. And there were two issues in that case. The first was the constitutionality of the Federal Housing Finance Administrator, the appointment and removal of that individual. The Supreme Court um, was very aggressive with that argument. Uh, the government, interestingly enough, didn't, through the Justice Department, they didn't attempt to even defend the constitutionality of the uh, Federal Housing Finance Administration, the way it was set up. And the key argument was the president didn't have the ability to remove that individual, except for some very, very significant reasons with cause. Um, as you've heard me say many times before, the, the Supreme Court or the, the government through the legislature has always attempted to create this fourth rail of government. We were set up with a balance of power structure, the legislative, the judicial, and then the executive branch of government. And Congress has always attempted one way or another to try and rule from the grave or set up rules, set up agencies, set up regulations that can't be changed going off into the future. And that is a constitutional issue. That's exactly what was addressed because the executive branch of government should have had the ability to remove the executive director of the Federal Housing Finance Administration for cause for any reason at any time. Um, and they attempted to tie his hands in the way the Housing and Economic Recovery Act was structured. The second issue in front of the court was the Administrative Procedures Act. Did the government violate the Administrative Procedures Act as, the same, as being the single creditor of Fannie and Freddie in cahoots with the Federal Housing Finance Administration, did they violate the APA when they directed 100% of the earnings and profits of the corporations to the government in perpetuity? That was the most important issue from our standpoint, because we believe that the government is going to lose on the constitutionality claim prospectively going forward, we believe the president will have a removal authority of the Federal Housing Finance Administrator. The issue is, the, the, the most important issue in front of the court was, did they violate 
their authority? Did they exceed their authority by taking 100% of the earnings and profits of the corporation? Well, I listened to the oral argument, and I have to admit a few people here. Hold on. Welcome to the four people that just came in. Um, we're just talking about the litigation right now. And I was just about to start with the Administrative Procedures Act and, and the legality of the government taking 100% of the earnings and profits of the corporation of Fannie and Freddie and the impact that that would have. And not to my surprise, but David Thompson did a brilliant job and the court was concerned, very concerned. And, and, and the most liberal and the most conservative members of the court weighed in on this. Justice Breyer, who we'd all agree is one of the more liberal members of the court, he used the word nationalization three times. Um, Justice Sotomayor had the same concerns. There was much discussion about that. and. In the um, unenviable position of anyone that's ever appearing before the United States Supreme Court, governments for the lawyers, or the lawyers for the government under the APA claim had to answer a series of questions by Judge Gorsuch. And it was in sequence. Well, Your Honor, we agree with, disagree with you on this point, but and we disagree with you on this point. We disagree with you on this point. However, if all of that is true, yes, we will lose this case. And, and so that's a, uh, that's a terrible position to be in. Um, for those of, this that, of us that have followed this closely, um, it, it was a bad showing for the government. It was a great showing for David Thompson. In fact, I spoke to him before I did the appearance on Fox News with Maria Bartiroma on December 22nd, and he was still in Hawaii recovering. You know, it, it's a very, very stressful thing to uh, appear before the United States Supreme Court, take on the government, no less. But he was very, very confident about the position that they were in with the APA claims. So. That is a, it was a big factor in, in all of this. Subsequent to that, on December 15th in the Lamberth case, and the Lamberth case is in the DC circuit. And Judge Lamberth, if you recall, in September of 2014, he dismissed the litigation against the government based upon the government's representation that Fannie and Freddie were in a death spiral that they were hopelessly bankrupt and because of that taking 100 percent of the earnings and profits of the corporation was profit was was proper well and, and they did it on the basis of an affidavit by the name by the, an individual at treasury his name was mario ugletti nobody seems to see much of mario ugletti these days because as we know now that was a false affidavit. It was a materially false statement. Call it perjury, call it fraud on the part of the government, but it was false. And that was the basis upon which Judge Lambert dismissed that case. And Judge Lambert is a very respected jurist. He's very respected in all of his, um, you know, by his peers. And as a result, many of these cases were dismissed in a domino effect based upon his ruling in that case. Well, in the U.S. Court of Claims, where the government um, has <coughs> jurisdiction over admitting people here, um, where the government has jurisdiction over um, takings, um, under the Constitution, Judge Sweeney allowed for a limited amount of discovery 
It was an error on the part of the government that allowed her to order some discovery. And during that discovery, we learned through the deposition of the chief financial officer of Fannie Mae at the time, Susan McFarland, that she had just briefed the government. Not only were they not bankrupt, but they were entering a huge age of profitability. They had solved their problems. The financial crisis was over. And they were going to have to write up billions of dollars of assets that they had written down. And in addition to her testimony, um, the government had an outside auditor, Grant Thornton. They were present. And they memorialized everything that Susan McFarland said to the Treasury on their work documents. And those work documents were part of the discovery as well. So without question, the government entered into an agreement to take 100% of the earnings and profits of the corporation in violation of HERA and contrary to what they had represented to a federal judge. They lied to a federal judge. And I want you all to understand that, the significance of that, lying to a federal judge. Because in my conversations with David Thompson, who was also the lead attorney on that case, and anyone that has ever practiced law, at a certain point in time, the trial record has to be certified before it goes, goes forward. Who is going to certify a false statement that has been made to a federal judge prior to a trial and prior to an assessment of damages? And that's where both Collins is on a remand for damages if the Supreme Court upholds the Fifth Circuit. And that's where we are right now in the Lambert case in the Eighth Circuit where we're headed towards trial. So on December 15th, there were 9,800 documents, 56,000 pages of information that the Treasury turned over as part of the discovery. They objected to having to turn over that information. Judge Lamberth ruled against them. And unlike previous cases where they attempted to appeal the ruling on a motion to compel on either an interlocutory appeal or a motion to reconsider, the government just said, okay, and they turned them over. And they turned over, and it was very similar to what they did in Collins, where they didn't even question and show up to, to, to argue the constitutionality of the appointment of the Federal Housing Finance Administrator. In fact, the Supreme Court hired an amicus lawyer, you know, a friend of the court, to argue the position that the government would not argue on behalf of themselves. So you can see this litigation is far more serious than what we thought up to this point. And sometimes your success can be a hindrance. And when I close out my remarks today, I want you to, to remember that because I think the litigation has worked in our favor. Um, and when I conclude, you'll see why, as I put together the different pieces of this. One of the things that is permeates the letter agreement, and, and I'm putting all of this up on the website so you can read the letter agreements for both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. You can read the Fifth Circuit. You can get, you can go back and listen to these oral arguments that I'm telling you about. But, but one of the things that that rings through these letter agreements is that as part of the recapitalization and release and the exit of conservatorship of Fannie and Freddie, these lawsuits have to be settled. Well, I remember, I've been in this long enough to remember when Howard Cain and Arnold and Porter mocked the shareholders for the litigation that they brought and said that they had no standing to bring the litigation. And we've been to the Supreme Court. We've discovered that there's fraud on the part of the government. I actually stood in front of 
the the a, a federal judge in Delaware as a plaintiff on the the uh, the issue of whether or not we had access to the books and ref records, and that judge denied it. And I remember looking at Howard Kane and the the eight lawyers that they had you know, at the, the government's table. And I thought to myself, this truly is David and Goliath bringing this fight to the federal government. Um, so, but we'll, we'll close out with that. Um, the next section that I wanna talk about that's in this letter agreement that you can go back and read is the, the, this whole issue of the capital requirements. And why is that important? What does that mean? Well, the capital that a financial institution has is the buffer between what is lost and ultimately what happens if the federal government has to come in and bail out a financial institution. And that has been something that we have redefined since 2008 with the end of the financial crisis all financial institutions have to have more capital. They have to demonstrate that they have more capital on an annual basis before a bank like Bank of America or JP Morgan or Citigroup, before they can increase a dividend, before they can do a share buyback. They have to get the blessing of the Federal Reserve on an annual basis where they prove out that they have adequate capital to meet a stress test. Well, the stress test is essentially a simulation of what happens if we end up in another financial crisis um, and, and how much capital they have in reserves before they become insolvent. So the capital requirements of Fannie and Freddie have gone through two years of intense scrutiny and formulation by Mark Calabria, who is the head of the Federal Housing Finance Administration. Mark Calabria and Michael Criminger wrote HERA when Criminger was general counsel for the FDIC and Calabria was chief of staff for Senator Shelby when Senator Shelby was chairman of the banking committee. So there's no one more qualified to do that than Mark Calabria. And Mark Calabria put a very, very high bar on the capital requirements. He wanted bank-like capital, 4% capital ratio, which is essentially the same capital ratio that JP Morgan and the rest of them have to have. That was a source of much, much controversy. You know, can they generate a return on equity? Can they attract shareholders? Is it really necessary to have the same amount of capital for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac as JP Morgan or Citibank or Bank of America? After all, they only do one thing. They securitize mortgages and they have a unique business model that's different than the rest of them. But that being said, that's where the capital rule ended up at 4%. And there was a lot of chatter about whether or not they would be able to attract capital and be successful exiting conservatorship. One of the things they did in this letter ruling was they reduced the capital requirement to 3% from 4% based upon their ability to exit conservatorship. And what, they've allowed, what they are allowing them to do is to exit conservatorship with far less capital, 25% less capital, over 25% less capital, and they'll allow them to build to that 4% based upon retained earnings. At the same time, they pay out dividends. Well, that's a very sensible approach. And remember, this is a new factor that I'll enter into this. JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley are the financial advisors. They are helping them raise capital to exit conservatorship. And so the treasury acknowledged that, yes, it will help us exit conservatorship faster if we um, 
don't have to raise as much capital. It is less dilutive. Retained earnings does not dilute shareholders. New capital dilutes shareholders. So the fact that they have to raise significantly less capital to exit conservatorship was a very, very positive development no one you know, thought about. The next thing that I want to recover, or, or want to, I want to cover, has to do with capital retention. And in this letter agreement, they have made a change. They have said that 100% of the earnings and profits of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will be retained by the entities. That's amazing because that it wasn't until September of 19 that they were even allowed to retain capital. Now they, and they put a threshold on it. They were bumping up against that threshold. Now they get to retain 100% of their capital. There's a catch to it. The catch to it is it shows as an asset on their liability, on their balance sheet, but there's an offsetting liability. And this is the liquidation preference. So every dollar of capital that they retain they have, hold on, I'm adding somebody here. Every dollar of capital that they retain, they have to add uh, a, a dollar that they owe the government. Now, that sounds really kind of screwy until you analyze and you go beneath the surface and you try to understand Treasury's position for that. And here's the analogy that I'll give you that I think everybody can kind of understand. Everybody has sold a home before or known somebody that sold a home. And if there's a mortgage on that home and you have a buyer and a seller and the buyer says, I wanna take possession of that home. And the seller says, fine and they allow the buyer into the home, but the buyer hadn't paid for the home yet. Does the seller release the mortgage on that home at the same time they give them possession of the home and the ownership of the home? No, they don't. And so what has to happen, and we will close with this, what has to happen is simultaneously as there's an agreement that ends the litigation and a, there's agreement on the capital and the capital structure and how it's going to be priced, that liquidation preference will be written down based upon the retained earnings. And the courts, jumping back for a minute, the courts are going to write down that litigation preference. Because if they rule that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were unjustly burdened by the Third Amendment sweep, then the money's paid back and the government actually owes those entities some, some additional funds. So we'll go forward now and, and I wanna you know, bring this um, to the next point, which is, the government's ownership stake. So in addition to advancing money to Fannie and Freddie at 10% interest, that now stands, still stands at approximately $192 billion, the government can exercise warrants equal to 79.6% of the outstanding common stock. Those warrants, as part of an agreement for recapitalization and release, they have to be exercised. So they can't sit back and allow those warrants just to fester. They have to be negotiated into recapitalization and release. And so what that does is whatever the government's interest is, as of recapitalization and release, it will be front and center and everyone will understand what it is. Um, so you've got four elements of this agreement that are all geared towards 
recapitalization and release and the exit of conservatorship. And when you go to the website um, and you look at these letter agreements and you look at section nine and section nine is the last um, section of this very, very complicated agreement. And I'm just gonna read it to you. The, the heading on this section nine in boldface is this, commitment to develop a proposal to resolve conservatorship. So the treasury is saying that they are committed to They're committed. They're absolutely committed to exiting conservatorship. And then let me read you what is underneath that. It says, in order to ensure a path for treasury to resolve its investment in the enterprise in a manner that fairly compensates taxpayers for the support that they have provided and continue to provide treasury, in consultation with the agency, have begun to work to establish a timeline and process to terminate the conservatorship and raise capital, including identifying any necessary legislation for reform of the enterprise and an analysis of the appropriate number of guarantee guarantors, including whether there should be one or multiple guarantors in order to facilitate the exit from conservatorship, Treasury and the enterprise commit to work to restructure Treasury's investment and dividend amount in a manner, in a manner that facilitates the orderly exit from conservatorship, ensures Treasury is appropriately compensated and permits the enterprise to raise third party capital and make distributions as appropriate, Treasury in consultation with the agency should endeavor to transmit a proposal that details this work to both houses of Congress on or before September 30th, 2021. So we have less than a nine month window where the treasury in this letter agreement is fully committed to having visibility for a plan that will allow these entities to raise capital and exit conservatorship. Um, now there's, as you can imagine, there's a lot of chatter um, in the background about all of this. And Washington DC is not a place where secrets are kept very well. Um, and a lot of people pay a lot of money to get as close to people as they can to get those secrets. And then those secrets get kind of disseminated and they get twisted around. It's like that game that we used to play as a kid, you know, where you'd write out a paragraph on how to build a box. The first person would read it and then they would turn to the second person and they would tell them what the instructions were to read the box, to build the box. And by the time those instructions had been passed to 20 people and the last person in the chain recited the instructions on how to build the box, how close to what the 20th person said was it to the first person and the actual instructions that were given? A lot of it gets messed up. In, in translation. And, and that's one of the things I think that has happened here. Uh, you know, they, if we look at what has happened and I look at my interaction, I've always felt like with this issue and the people that have been involved with this issue, I have always felt like the litigation was going to be the driving force in this. And on my part, it was a little naive to think that anybody, including Mnuchin, would take on the tough 
political challenge of saying that the government has been paid back. Um, in fact, after this agreement, this will show you how Washington works. After this agreement was written, Maxine Waters, and it was released after the market about five o'clock on Thursday, January 14th, about 10.30 or 11 o'clock, Maxine Waters, who's head of the Senate Bank or the House Banking Committee, Finance Committee, she released a statement criticizing the letters from the letter agreements as benefiting, exclusively benefiting a group of hedge funds and unduly benefiting the shareholders. Um, and it was it was kind of a vicious letter. And then Sherrod Brown, who's on the Senate Banking Committee, did the same thing. Well, they hadn't even read the letter agreement. They don't understand the issue. I am very, very confident of that because I've been before both of them. Um, and, and so you have this confusion that was created by all of that. When I said it was naive on my part, it was naive on my part to think that anybody would have the courage to just come forward and say, we messed up and we've been paid back. Um, that message has been communicated to Treasury Secretary Yellen. And what I discounted, as, as excited as I was about the success of David Thompson and the release of this information in the litigation, as excited as I was about that, I failed to consider the position that the government was in. They now have to protect the taxpayers and they've been unburdened of doing, of taking on the tough political challenge of saying this money's been paid back because the court's gonna do it for them and they know they're gonna lose. And that's why for the first time in these two letter agreements, they made as a condition that all the litigation be settled except for one piece of litigation that is a direct claim against the government and it cannot exceed four, $5 billion. And it's ironic, I'm very familiar with that piece of litigation. It challenges the actual conservatorship itself and the claim there is four and a half billion dollars. So the government for the first time has actually considered that. In fact, if you go back um, to the late fall of 2019, Arlen Porter has handled this litigation and they've been billing the government over $20 million a year. And I know that didn't sit well with the current director of the Federal Housing Finance Administration. It didn't sit well with Treasury. They went outside and they hired, they got a request for proposal. They hired a law firm by the name of Millbank, huge firm. And Millbank actually acted as, a, as an independent legal advisor to the treasury to help them evaluate their position in the litigation because they were losing. They had just lost in the fifth circuit an en banc hearing in the fifth circuit. And they were headed to the Supreme court and the United States Supreme court is very unlikely to overturn an en banc hearing of a prior court. All they would do more than likely is clarify that. And so they even hired an independent outside advisor. And so how did all of that get into that agreement? They're concerned about the litigation. They understand that it would be very difficult to turn this back to the companies, have them raise money and settle the litigation at the same time. So they've added that as another condition. But as I've told you, and I just read it, you know, it's right here. It is number nine on both of the letter agreements. The language is exactly the same. The government is committed to having these entities exit conservatorship. So that becomes a question. The question then becomes, what are we going to get? What is the value of our shares? What is it going to be? And 
that depends on a, on a number of things. As I've told you, the, the most secure position to be in is to be a preferred shareholder. The preferreds have either a 25 or a $50 par value. Because of the litigation in Judge Lambert's court, we have tremendous leverage on a damage model that David Thompson publicly in a press conference I did with him in January, February timeframe of 2019, he said it's $12 a share and rising based upon post-judgment interest. And the trial in Judge Lambert's court is focuses singularly on the issue of the contract rights of preferred shareholders. So as we go through, as they go through these negotiations, the preferred shareholders have tremendous leverage in how this big piece of pie is going to be split up. And there will be a negotiation between the shareholders that have a vested interest in this and the shareholders that are providing new capital. Well, one of the interesting things about the capital structure and who owns what at this point is the number of existing shareholders that will be the source of additional capital. And I'll give the example of two. All of this is public information. Under the Investment Company Act of 1940, every shareholder has to release their holdings um, and what they've bought and what they've sold on a quarterly basis. So when you look at the number of different preferred issues, and there's dozens of them, we own maybe eight or nine, you can see who the largest shareholder is under the, large, under the Investment Company Act. Of 1940. Well, two of the largest shareholders are the nation's largest pension fund, TIAA CREF, and Capital Research and Management, which manages the American funds. That, that's the parent company that manages the American funds. They were original shareholders of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. No one understands this issue better than them. And so it becomes very difficult for them to be a source of new capital if they're not being treated well on their existing shares. So I think that there's going to be a lot of demand. I, I don't worry at all about whether or not they'll be able to raise the money. Um, in the current environment that we're in, there is a need for companies with real earnings and real profits. You'll see in my um, year-end letter that's going out today um, that, you know, we poke a lot of holes in what is going on right now. It is very reminiscent of 2000. It's a time to be focused on value. And I'll close with two things. First, um, you know, following the financial crisis of 2008, and we recovered very, very well, um, but I didn't like the drawdown. I didn't like the fact that we got hit. And, and I've, I've spent a little bit of time in every waking day thinking about how do I protect you? How do I protect myself from that point in time where all of a sudden everybody realizes that Tesla is so overvalued that it's going to crash. How do I protect you against the inevitability of what happens in a bubble like February of 2000 when NASDAQ lost 82% of its value over the next 10 years? How do I communicate to you that with any company, no matter how much you like it, the valuation of that company is the most important single factor in your long-term success and what your entry point is in that valuation. You still don't believe me, even though I tell you Snap-on Tools has performed better than Microsoft. 
in the last 20 years. And I can give you examples of a lot of companies. It's still hard to believe that Warren Buffett, despite the fact that he generated a 2% return for shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway in the 16% market last year, that he has done significantly better than the S&P 500 his entire career and in the last 20 years. It's hard to communicate that, but that is the challenge. And so as we look at that, I'm trying to find ways of creating non-correlating assets, meaning when the market goes down, we've got things that are gonna go up. I addressed that without even knowing what I was doing essentially in 2000 when I owned Genesco. And I remember taking the heat over that, but I thought it was a great company with great earnings with upside. And when Genesco went from two to $50 while Microsoft went down and all the other tech stocks went down like Sun Microsystems losing 98% of its value, that created the opportunity for success because we had something we could sell that was going up that we could reinvest into things that were going down. It is that simple. And so Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they have become that non-correlating asset. And about the time that we get this settled, we will have an asset that will be going up, I believe, at the same time, other things that are going down. Um, and, and that will help protect us. And, and during a period like this, you take a lot of heat for it because as I said in my year and letter, it's real easy to watch. It, it's very difficult to watch your neighbors get rich. Um, and, and whether or not that's real wealth or not, time will tell. And so finally, I want to read something to you. I got this from um, a credit analyst that does a lot of trading um, for a large company. Um, and, and he sees who's buying and who's selling. Um, and and he, he wrote down some bullet points that I think um, are very appropriate when we look at Fannie and Freddie. He said, number one, you're looking at pricing a security of a company in reorganization. Well, inherently, that creates uncertainty. And so despite the fact that these have par value of $25 and $50, they're going to trade based upon that uncertainty until you move towards more and more certainty. The security is very liquid with both institutional and retail following. In other words, for one reason or another, people will enter and exit a security and there is liquidity um, for that. But the rewards are going to come at the point in time where the uncertainty, the reorganization, everything is settled. Um, the security is 100% covered from a value standpoint. The value of the entity is well in excess of our claim on the capital structure. With the preferred securities, they're $33 billion at face value. That's a rounding error in organizations that have $6 trillion worth of assets and 35 to $45 billion of annual pre-tax profits when run properly. The next one, the US government has an option to purchase 80% of the entity for $1. That's not going to impact the value of our shares. It's not, unless it impacts common, it does not impact preferred. The pedigree of smart money invested in this security is like best of show in Westminster. TIA, CREF, Capital Group, some of the smartest hedge fund managers in the world and others. The entity itself is necessary for national economic health. We have to have a strong housing market. You know, and as I told Maria Bartiromo on December 22nd, you know, Fannie Mae and subsequently Freddie Mac years ago, they were so the solutions to help the George Bailey's of the world 
fight off the Mr. Potters in, in the building and loans in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. These businesses are not impacted by technological obsolescence. They don't have heavy research and development expense. Once they are, they exit conservatorship, they essentially are fully capitalized. And the only capital retention requirements that they will have are the ordinary course of obsolescence in the business, just like any business, technology, furniture, people. And they'll retain capital to get to that 4% capital allocation. The entity provides a service to rich and poor alike, but it's more, but is more important to the less wealthy. In other words, the success of these entities go more towards moderate income and, and, and middle America and, and others. The, as I told Maria, the largest loan that you can get on Fannie Mae is $512,000. The average loan is less than half of that. And there are people that are routinely paying $100,000 for a car now that will be technologically obsolete and will be headed to the rust pile in six or seven years. The business is easy to understand and should be easy to value by institutional investors once these roadblocks, once the Treasury complies with their stated intent in, as they move forward in Section 9 of the agreement. The entity has one of the most powerful and sophisticated financial advisors assisting them in its effort to raise capital. That is J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley. And as I joke many times, they get a performance fee. They don't get paid until they are successful. The big payoff is based upon their success. And those of you that have ever been out riding horses on vacation or whatever, and you hop on a trail horse, you know, you get towards the end of that ride and those horses, you've heard the expression, JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley are going to be like trail horses headed to the barn because that's when they get fed, that's when they get my big butt off of them and they get water and they have to live until, you know, they get freedom until the next time somebody that doesn't know what they're doing climbs on top of them. And then finally, this has drug on for over 12 years um, and, and it's time for it to end. They've established a time frame for it to end and it, is coincidental that it's going to happen as this litigation comes to an end. So for all those reasons, you know, I'm continuing to recommend that we hold. I think, you know, one of the terrible things that Treasury did um, in, in all of this is that they released this information on Thursday night after the close of the market. And the expectations that we all ha had were that they were going to write down the liquidation preference and that this would be settled. And, and as I look back on it now, that's part of what I mean. By, it was naive. The strength of the litigation had far more impact on this issue than anything. And there's continuity. This will be Janet Yellen's job to finish. Um, and it will be uh, done in a very, very orderly manner. The time frame actually really hasn't changed because even if Secretary Mnuchin had done what everybody expected him to do, um, we'd still be looking at nine months to 12 months and you'd still have uncertainty about how it, it will, you know, was going to play out. Um, one of the more interesting things in this journey that I've had and in being involved with this issue is that I sit on the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. And if any of you saw the confirmation hearings yesterday with Janet Yellen, um, they were kind of 
they, they didn't challenge her a whole lot about the budget deficit and the tremendous debt that we're building up. Um, and, but they reminded her that she was a director of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. And what was she gonna do about it? And she said, well, now's not the time to do it. Interest expense, because rates are low, the interest expense on the budget is the same as it was in 2008. And we've got to get through this crisis first. But as part of her being a board member and me being a member, we had an annual, we have an annual meeting. And in September of 2019, at our annual meeting in the cocktail reception before the formal part of the program started, um, we were standing out on the, the top of this rooftop garden where the event was being held. Everybody was, you know, having a glass of wine or whatever. And, and there she was. And somebody had just said, thank you and walked away. I walked up and got right in front of her. And I can tell you, she came up to about my belly button and I'm not that tall. And I sat there and, and, and talked to her. And after the initial pleasantry, she asked me what I did for a living. Um, I explained that to her. Um, I asked her about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I told her that I had shareholders just like you and, and asked her, you know, what her thoughts were about it. And I think in that conversation, you know, it was very revealing. She said, I'm not as familiar with the litigation as you are, but my concern has always been the periodic commitment fee that the government gets for backing these entities. And the periodic commitment fee is what's the government paid to have to act as a backstop in the event that Fannie and Freddie failed as was alleged in 2008, the basis of the conservatorship. And that takes on two, that, that's a two part answer to that question. The first is the amount of capital that they have in front of the entities. And so that's what Director Calabria has put in place. And the Financial Services Oversight Committee, of which the, the Treasury Secretary and the head of the Federal Reserve are both members, they endorsed the need for capital. They endorsed bank-like capital. They endorsed the plan that Treasury Secretary Calabria, or that FUFA Director Calabria and Treasury Secretary Mnuchin calibrated and put in front of them back in November. They got their buy-in for, for it. And so the answer to now Treasury Secretary Yellen's question and the answer that she gave me in September of 2019, it's been answered. And there should be no further objections to getting these entities recapitalized and released within the nine month time frame, And then we'll have a whole different set of questions and, and, and meetings about how we diversify the proceeds from this longstanding investment that we've had. So that concludes the uh, presentation that I have. Um, it's two, we've got a lot of people on this call, so it's almost impossible um, to take questions. If you have specific questions, send them to us. I'll put them up on the website. Please use the information that we've got on the website. You know, everybody can have an opinion. There can only be one set of facts. Daniel Patrick Monahan said that the first time in 1986, before he started negotiations on the future of Social Security. And, and I want to deal with the facts. I'll never react to emotion um, when it comes to making investments and when it comes to reacting to investments. And I'll take the heat, and I'm taking a little of the heat right now, but we will prevail. And that is probably the best sign that we're going to be successful in this. So thank you.
Happy New Year. And I look forward to being able to deliver a lot of positive news throughout the year on this issue.